Good morning, colleagues, students, and friends. Grace to you and peace from God, our Creator, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Convocation 2020. This is a time of worship where we together prepare to embark upon another academic year. I would especially like to welcome our new students to Columbia Seminary. We are delighted that you are joining this community of learning and service. It is also my pleasure to welcome back many of you to Columbia Seminary for another academic year. And today, we welcome one special guest back to our community, the Reverend Dr. Kimberly Bracken Long as our convocation speaker. We are especially excited to welcome her back as one of our own. Dr. Long taught for 10 years as the Associate Professor of Worship here at Columbia Seminary. Dr. Long is both a scholar and a pastor of the highest order, and her work and life are marked by her deep love for the church, her empathy, and her careful attention to embodied worship. She is the author of several books, most recently the book Inclusive Marriage Services, a Wedding Source Book. She currently serves as the editor of the quarterly journal Call to Worship, Liturgy, Music, Preaching, and the Arts, and has also served as a contributor and editor for the Feasting on the Word series and the Book of Common Worship of the PCUSA. In her writing, she explores the rich and varied spiritual and liturgical resources of the Reformed tradition. Dr. Long, we have missed you dearly, and it is a joy to have you with us once again. Friends, in, in many ways, this year will be unlike any other in Columbia's long history. Never before have we gathered for convocation in this virtual format. Never before have we had to quickly determine how to administer our classes in a distance learning format. In our lifetimes, we have never had to endure the hardships, pain, and loss associated with a global health pandemic. In other ways, the year will be familiar. With courage, we will continue in our common struggle for freedom and justice alongside black and brown people in the United States and around the world. With wisdom, we will all participate in yet another contentious presidential election in the United States. We will together continue to weather the burgeoning storms of climate change, and we will do all this empowered by the Holy Spirit, seeking to remain true to our shared calling and our core mission. This year, perhaps now more than ever, I am persuaded that our shared work of educating and nurturing leaders for God's church and the world is absolutely essential. This is not a moment to be swayed by fear. It is a moment to pursue our callings with greater perseverance. And this is the reason we've gathered today, to once again affirm our commitments to one another, to Columbia, and most importantly, to God. Later in this service, we will once again make promises to one another. We will, of course, commit to pursuing academic excellence. However, we will also covenant to seek peace, solidarity, and transformative relationships with one another. We will make these commitments knowing that they will help us to become more faithful to God, to grow in spiritual maturity and discipleship, and to make room for the peace of God in our seminary and in the world. These promises and practices will carry us through a year like this one, and I pray we will hold fast to them in the days ahead. And now, friends in Christ, I welcome you to the 193rd session of Columbia Theological Seminary. Let us worship God. Join me in the call to worship. God promised to gather us up, to bring us together, although we may be scattered across the land. 
We sing together the greatness of God. God promised us comfort, a release from terror, and freedom from all that binds us on earth. We pursue truth and seek justice, marveling at the abundance of God. God promised that the people would be satisfied with this bounty. We work together that all people might share in God's bounty. Amen. Come on and sing with us. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. You ought to praise Him. Jesus, blessed Savior, He's worthy to be praised. Let's sing that again. Come on, y'all. Sing praise. Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Yeah. Praise Him. Jesus, blessed Savior, He's worthy to be praised. From the My friends, our God is a God of love and a God of grace who yearns to be in relationship with each and every one of us. 
God says to us, come, tell the truth of your lives, and you will be made new. With confidence in that grace, let us bring before God our sorrows, our sins, our griefs, our frustrations, that we may once again be made whole. Let us pray first silently and then join together. Let us pray. Friends, let us join together in one voice from around the world. Almighty God, you poured your spirit upon gathered disciples, creating a new community of faith. We confess that we hold back the force of your spirit among us. We do not always communicate your word of grace, practice the truth of your love, or live as a people made one in Christ. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Transform our lives by the power of your spirit and fill us with a desire to be your faithful people, doing your will, our Lord. United and set free to serve God and God's people. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, in your will discover peace. Amen. A reading from Psalm 119. Your decrees are wonderful, therefore we keep them. The unfolding of your words gives light, imparting understanding to the simple. With open mouths we pant, because we long for your commandments. Turn to us and be gracious to us, as is your custom toward those who love your name. Keep our steps steady according to your promise, Never let iniquity have dominion over us. Redeem us from human oppression, that we may keep your precepts, make your face shine upon your servants, and teach us your statutes. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea that caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, 
Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. President Van Dyke, Dean Seacrest, members of the board, students, staff, faculty, and friends of the seminary. I am honored to be with you today for this most unusual convocation service in this most unusual year. There are many reasons why I wish we could all be together on campus right now. How I would love to see old friends and meet new ones and I especially wish that I could be there on Monday for the dedication of Riggs Commons. Professor Riggs, thank you. Even though this is a different sort of year, it's good to be marking this occasion with you. I have to admit though that day, today's convocation has caused me to ask a question. But first, have you ever walked into a room and suddenly wondered, why am I here? Or maybe you've walked the streets of a new city, confident that you know exactly where you're going, until all of a sudden you stop short, <laughs> look around, and think, how did I get here? Or perhaps you woke up one day and realized you're in seminary of all places and asked yourself that very same question, why am I here? It's not a bad question. What are you doing here? You know, there's a global pandemic on the earth is dying a not very slow death. Our political system is in shambles. People are still dying for being black. Even my five-year-old granddaughter just asked when 2020 is going to be over. Things are a mess. So what are you doing here? What are you doing at a seminary? In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells an abundance of stories to teach people about the kingdom of heaven. Here, especially in the 13th chapter, he tells one story after another after another. At first glance, they seem, well, quaint. They're about farming and fishing and baking, things everyday people do all the time. At the beginning of the chapter, after Jesus tells this great crowd that has gathered, the first parable, the one about the farmer sowing seeds, the disciples sidle up to him and ask him sotto voce, why are you teaching them in parables? Which, you know, is another way of saying, why don't you just come out and say what you mean? Jesus' answer is mystifying. He says, because they don't understand, but you do. And then he goes on to tell them more parables about a small seed that grows into a tree large enough to offer shelter to all the birds who need it, whether they have papers or not. About a woman who mixes yeast into her dough spreading good trouble all around. About a man who stumbles over a treasure in a field, finding an unbelievable gift, something he wasn't even looking for. About another man, a, a merchant, who is seeking a rare gem and finds it after a lifetime of looking. And finally, he tells them about fishermen who pull up a net of fish, then separate the good from the bad, promising that one day all forces of injustice 
will be banished and that when all is said and done, love wins. With every parable, we get a different glimpse of what the kingdom of heaven is. Each parable paints a picture that's a little different than the last. This is not a systematic theology. The parables raise as many questions as they answer. And yet, when the stories are over, Jesus looks at the disciples and says, you got all that? To which they reply, yep. Anyone who says the Bible is not a funny book hasn't read it. So no, Jesus did not, does not explain what the reign of God is like. All he can do is, is describe it. It's, it's this way and, and it's this way and it's, and it's also like this. Because how do you explain true love? All you can do is point to it, to imagine it, to keep watch for it, to live into it. I live just outside a small town on the eastern shore of Maryland. There are only about 12,000 people in our little city of Cambridge. Quite a change from Atlanta. Some people are like my husband and me. We've come here because we've fallen in love with the place. But most people who live here represent families who have been here for generations. Some of the people in our town are descended from slave owners. And some of the people in town remember their ancestors who were enslaved by those same families. There are black folks and white folks, white folks who share the same last name, including the name of Tubman. This is where Harriet was born. Back in the day, Cambridge was the place where all the jazz greats came to perform. Ellie Fitzgerald, Ella Fitzgerald, Louis Armstrong, uh, Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, Cab Calloway, they were all here. Local black DJs dubbed Cambridge Groove City. The music clubs were all on Pine Street, the street where members of the substantial black community owned businesses and homes. One block away, running parallel to Pine, is Race Street, so named because horses from the mills used to be raced down that street. Race Street is where all the white businesses were. People from Pine Street were not welcome on Race Street, and folks from Race Street really didn't care what was happening over on Pine. A lot has changed since the, since the 1950s and 60s. The history is complex and rich and often painful. But last month, a group of people gathered, white and black, younger and older, to paint Black Lives Matter down the middle of Race Street. The letters were painted in the yellow and black, um, red and white colors of our outrageous Maryland flag. The words were adorned with the portraits of Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, who was born one town over, and local civil rights hero, Gloria Richardson. It's beautiful. The street that everyone remembers as the domain of white privilege now holds a new message and a new mandate. It only took about two weeks until a young man, a white man, egged on by his friends, squealed the tires of his jacked up pickup and laid tracks right through that beautiful new mural. There was outrage, there was anger and disgust. When citizens stepped up to repaint the mural, a wise city councilman had a conversation with the mural's leading artist, an African-American woman. What can he do, he said, to keep from doing this over and over again? How can we keep from entering a cycle of painting and repainting every time something like this happens? 
The artist told him that she didn't want to cover up the tracks. She wanted to let the scars of the violence show, but she wanted to transform them. So a week later, people gathered again to repaint the mural. They let the tire tracks remain showing on the pavement between the letters. But on the letters themselves, they turned those tracks into roses. Before the painting began, however, the young man who laid those tracks down apologized publicly. There were quite a few people gathered there and those who listened were civil, but they did not let him off easy. He then listened to members of the community talk about the pain that his actions had caused. He stood before them as they explained to him that his white skin earned him the privilege of apologizing and getting a chance to make things right, an opportunity he would not have been afforded if his skin had been black. There were speeches and hard questions. It was uncomfortable, but it was real. And when the talking was over and the painting began, the young man, young man and his parents helped repair that mural that he had marred, staying late into the night until the work was done. Maybe the kingdom of heaven is something like tire tracks that are turned into roses. Why are you here? You're here to tell the truth. You're here to heal wounds. You're here to seek justice as you anticipate God's future. You are here to proclaim that the kingdom of God is on its way, that the reign of heaven is here even now showing up here on earth. You are here to answer Jesus' call, to do what he did, to live like the reign of God has already arrived. Why are you here? You are here because this world needs this good news now more than ever. You are here because God is calling us to repair the breaches. Yes, at Columbia Seminary and everywhere else that they exist. You are here because activism without eschatological hope is never going to be enough. Because our good intentions alone can't sustain us. Because we cannot do this work without divine power to uphold us and propel us. You are here to claim the promises of God, to enact that heavenly realm here and now in your worship and in your work. You are here to keep painting those pictures so that all can see what the kingdom of heaven is like. You are here to keep telling the story so that all can hear, to help us all imagine just what true love is really like. Thanks be to God. And may God bless the work that you will do together in this extraordinary time. Preparation for the king, and they line their sidewalks with every sort of shiny thing they will be surprised when they hear him say. Take me to the alley 
Take me to the afflicted ones. Take me to the lonely ones that somehow lost their way. Hear me say, I am your friend. Come to my table. Rest here in my garden. You will have a part. Take me to the alley. Take me to the afflicted ones. Take me to the lonely ones that somehow lost their way. Let them hear me say, hey, I am your friend. Come to my table. Rest here in my garden, yeah. you will have a part. They will be surprised when they hear him say, say, take me to the alley, take me to the afflicted ones, take me to the lonely ones that some how lost their way. Let them hear me say, I am your friend. Please come here to my table. Rest here in my garden. You will have a part. You will have a part. Take me to the alley. Take me to the afflicted ones. Take me, take me. Take me, take me. Madam Chair, it gives me great pleasure to present to you and to our students the world-class faculty of Columbia Theological Seminary. We are eight scholars learned in the history doctrine, ethics, and theology of the church. Six innovative and expert interpreters of the sacred scriptures and their effects in the world. And 13 masters of the theory, theology, and practice of ministry. For the sake of the church and the world, all of us are teaching, leading, and learning alongside our students to the glory of God Almighty. Each year at Convocation, faculty, staff, and students covenant to help fulfill the mission of Columbia Seminary. 
These covenants are made in the presence of God and alongside colleagues and friends. At this time, I invite the faculty of Columbia Theological Seminary to once again affirming your covenant. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and through him believe in one triune God? If so, please say, in the body of Christ, I do. In the body, in the body, in the body of Christ, 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 I do. In the presence of God, do you promise to be faithful to the purposes of the seminary as expressed in its statement of mission, bylaws, and plan of government? If so, please say, with gratitude and praise, I do. With, with gratitude, gratitude and praise, praise, I, do. I, do. I do. Now please join me in stating your intentions as a faculty member of Columbia Theological Seminary. I pledge and covenant, relying upon the grace of God to seek the peace, unity, and purity of the whole church, to practice the best standards of academic integrity and excellence, to exercise pastoral oversight of those committed to my charge, and to demonstrate a spirit of collegiality in all that I do in and for this seminary as long as I may serve. Amen. As Columbia opens for this 193rd session, it is my honor to introduce the staff. The staff at Columbia is a high-functioning, well-qualified team of over 56 full and part-time folks with over 450 cumulative years of service to Columbia. There are an even greater number of external service providers providing support to the seminary. All of these folks work hard, they are engaged, and they truly support Columbia. Now these last six months have certainly been challenging, and the staff has delivered every day while working in an ever-changing environment with creativity, resilience, imagination, and courage. Thank you once again for having Columbia Seminary ready to welcome students to a new academic year. I now invite my colleague, Ms. Jody Sauls, to lead us in the staff affirmation. Staff colleagues and friends, please join me in affirming our staff covenant. Will you seek to serve Columbia Theological Seminary with a spirit of goodwill, holding your colleagues in esteem and working collegially? If so, join me in saying, I will. Will you work together with faculty and students to further the mission of the seminary and to be a force for good in the world? If so, please say with me, I will. Madam Chair, it is my privilege and my honor to present to you and the entire Columbia community, our students. Students are at the center of all we do here. It is our mission to educate and nurture imaginative and resilient leaders for God's church and the world. And if there was ever a time that we need to Columbia this fall, welcome to each of you. Our new students join us from literally around the world. They represent over 13 different countries, over 15 different denominational traditions, and they come from a wide range of racial and ethnic backgrounds. These new students give me courage. These new students bring me joy. And I am so thrilled to present to you, Madam Chair, and the entire community, our students. The plan of government states that upon matriculation, the seminary and each student shall enter into the following covenant. Relying upon God's grace, will you, so long as you are a student of Columbia Theological Seminary, promise and covenant to be diligent in your studies, seek academic excellence, pursue such learning as joins mind and heart, and strive to live your life consistent with your calling as a disciple of Jesus Christ. If so, please say, I will. Will you promise and covenant to make the worship of God a central feature of your life 
and seek to grow in spiritual maturity and Christian discipleship? If so, please say, I will. Recognizing that growth in Christian discipleship and theological education is a lifelong process, will you promise and covenant to engage throughout your life in regular periods of disciplined study to sustain your ministry and enlarge your skills for the sake of the church and its mission in the world? If so, please say, I will. And now, having heard this commitment, will the faculty and staff of Columbia join me in an affirmation of our students? In reliance upon God's grace and in faithfulness to Jesus Christ, the church, and you, Columbia Theological Seminary promises and covenants to provide the best theological resources we can offer for your academic growth, personal welfare, and spiritual growth as you prepare for the service of God in the Church of Jesus Christ, and to offer the seminary to you throughout your life to empower, enrich, and renew your faith and ministry. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of Columbia Theological Seminary, I welcome you to our 193rd session. I am delighted now to honor returning students for outstanding academic accomplishments with prayer that God would continue to bless their work for the sake of the church. The Abdullah Award is a prize for the best paper setting forth a plan for the teaching of Bible in the public schools. And this year's recipient is Carol Perry. The Julia Abdullah Award for the best paper on the subject, How to Make the Church School Hour the Most Interesting Hour of the Week, goes to Lynn Ann Pabst. Alice Campbell Wilson is the winner of this year's Ludwig Richard Max DeWitt's Old Testament Studies Award for the best Old Testament exegesis paper. We have two winners this year for the Emma Galliard Boyce Memorial Award for writing the best paper on the creative use of music in worship. They are Denori Dalvin Henderson and Erin Marie Tola. The Flory Wilkes Sanders Prize in Theology goes to the best paper applying theological scholarship to the needs of Christian people in the contemporary world. And this year's winner is Mama Soa. Our last prize is for the Dabney and Tom Dixon Creation Care Sermon Award. Christophe Abreu Rosario received this award, which was originally announced back in April. Congratulations to all of our award winners. Each year, I have the distinct honor of announcing the winner of the Betsy Burgess Staff Service Award. This award was established in 1996 upon the retirement of Betsy Burgess, who exemplified the values of service, collegiality, and excellence across a wide array of responsibilities in her work at Columbia Seminary for 22 years. Each year, the staff council nominates a fellow staff member to receive this cash award in recognition of the recipient's faithfulness and dedicated service to the seminary. This year's very deserving recipient has served Columbia Seminary for 25 years with patience, with dedication, and with good humor. The recipient is a valuable source of information institutional knowledge, and a trusted resource for students, staff, and faculty alike. Friends, I am honored to present Ms. Mary Martha Revere with the 2020 Betsy Burgess Staff Service Award.
Congratulations, Mary Martha. Thank you for all you do for the seminary. We, we appreciate you and celebrate you. Once again, from all of us, congratulations. May God fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And whatever you do, in word and deed, do in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God. Amen. I see the light coming. No matter what it is, that I'm facing. The light. Whoa! Oh.